well, in the previous lecture, we uh, did some more optimizations. Um, in this lecture, we're going to um, fix some errors that we made, talk about some important points to note in order to make the code more robust, and then refactor our alpha 2 and 3 to use the new um, alpha engine. So actually, if, if you realize, um, if it's not realized by now, uh, there's actually an error in our previous code. So you can see um, if you run this on the first alpha class, you are going to see a capital value that is different from this, right? So we're going to get 9,825, and uh, this is not very ideal. So actually, the problem here is um, quite subtle. Um, in previous optimization, we decided to use this raw value, right? So and suppose we take this thing away. Um, we will actually get back the original 60,000 um, plus capital. And this is quite subtle, but also in a very important way when you're doing the testing for our code. So you see, you just by taking away this raw equals to true, we get a different result. Now in order to see what is happening, um, let me show you this code. Right? So let's do it there. Z score. So let's put it here. And then I'll put the code down. So this is just a tactic sugar for this. So it's supposed to be common this out and then we do this. Yeah. We can, in fact, print out exactly what's going on. So for example, if we do this, okay. Um, so let's print out x and then let's see what's going on. And without the raw flag set to true, what happens is you're going to perform the operations using the newly created parentheses instead of the underlying data frame. And what happens when you do this is you're going to get operations that supposedly, even though they include NAND values, this computation works perfectly fine, and this x here is a pan series. Now, on the other hand, if it's raw equals true, what you're going to get on the x side, you're going to get on x over here, is going to be a NumPy array. And when you get a NumPy data type as an array, the NumPy data type is not able to handle. Um, so for example, you can go further down, and you can see that even though the, there are a lot of numbers populated, if there are NAND values hidden, if there are even one NAND value hidden inside, the entire computation is going to be zero because this np.min or this np.std is going to be a NAND value. But that means that NumPy array data types are not good at handling NAND values. And this is because the underlying data type of the parent series, for example, has a, this, there's a, there's a NAND aware uh, mask. So we say that this panda series, right, so we say that the panda series is NAND aware. What it does is, you know, for example, it has numbers like A, B, C, and then NAND, and D. And the panda series is aware that um, that we have a NAND value, and when we do operations like this, it will ignore the NAND value, so it will do the computation, everything that, that the Boolean mask set to one, and then it will return the result and put it back in the correct um, slots. However, when you're using NumPy arrays, um, you are not aware, um, well, basically, we will need to do the logic by ourselves in order to filter out the NAND values. Now, you might think that, therefore, we should just stop using, um, so if, if we have, you might think that if we have NAND values in our data, you might think, okay, NumPy is completely useless, or we have to just stick to pandas, and therefore pandas, um, and because pandas are slow, then your code will be correspondingly slow. Well, this is not true because um, NumPy does allow us to use operations that allow for NAND values. So, uh, for example, you set draw equals to true, um, NumPy has a NAND mean and NAND std function. So let's see what this does, right? So, um, we know that these um, functions are in fact slower than the than the NAND unaware function. So this is a NAND aware function, mean function, and this is slower than the NAND unaware counterpart. Right. So um, you can see that the mean um, that this function is able to handle NAND values. Anyway, this is slower, but it, there is still the added benefit, right, that we do not have to create new panda series every time we're moving through the data frame. So that is the difference. So if you want to keep the accuracy of that while being able to use underlying um, pandas data structure, underlying numpy data structures, then you're going to be using NAND aware functions instead of the um, unaware functions. Now if you do this, then I think we can see whether our result is correct. Then it's okay, right? So you can see that our end result is still correct. And um, okay, so let's just you know kind of go back into this and try to refactor the other code. So we know that the first one is already correct, so we can just kind of remove this in the middle. Um, you know, okay, it takes about 12.9 seconds, so you know, 
not that important because we're not in the optimizing phase anymore. We want to make sure that we can run this alpha 2 and alpha 3 correctly. So what happens if you know you just take this alpha 1 and alpha 2 and you just run this? Well, if you remember correctly, uh, this will not run because we don't bring um, temp equals to the array and um, let's say do that and then let's take temp dot temp. Let's do that here, and then let's try to take temp to the place. Um, actually, before I go on to the L for two, I do want to kind of highlight another point. Right, so for example, I just run this back to alpha one. Now, if you look at our alpha score, right, what is the value of the alpha? Here it's setting of infinity and negative infinity values to zero. When do we get infinity values? We get infinity values, right? So temp you have is basically referring to this op four, and op four is computed from this. And op4 will therefore be infinity if high minus low is zero, which is when high and low is high minus low is equal to zero, which is basically when the instrument did not trade on the particular row. Now in order to um, so what is the sign of that? The sign of that is determined by well close minus low is going to be positive sign, high minus close is also going to be a positive sign. So the sign of this is going to depend on whether close is closer. To the, the distance between close to low and distance between close to high because it's taking positive value minus positive value which just can be either positive or negative and because volume is always positive or at least not negative then we can get positive infinity or negative infinity values but now let's think about instances where we do not in fact have positive infinity or negative infinity but valid entries now when we have valid entries this entire thing can be positive or negative now, so when we set the default value of invalid instruments to zero, we are actually giving it a valid value, right? We are putting zero as a in-place um, default alpha value. But it is possible that if all the other instruments are below zero or greater than zero in their alpha score, that these default values become either the, become part of the first 25 percentile or the bottom 25 percentile. So you might think about whether the default values that you are assigning to somewhat un or ineligible assets. You might think twice about whether the default values you're assigning is the desired behavior you want. Now in this case, I think that it would be better to set this to man values, right? Because if you set it to zero, it's going to affect the z-score computation. On the other hand, if you set it to man values, you're going to ignore it in the computation. Now necessarily, this means that we are going to get most probably a different value for the capital. So in our original implementation, the default value of invalid takers had an alpha score of zero. In this case, we're saying that we want to ignore them from the computation. So this is um, changing the logic of the signal generation altogether, right? So in this case, this has nothing to do with you know, coding. It's about um, what is the logic you're trying to implement? What is the signal you want to try to implement from a um, market standpoint? OK, moving on. Let's go to alpha 2. Right, we want to refactor alpha 2 in order to do that. So over here, we have um, we put the alpha values inside this uh, dictionary. And inside the post compute, we will have all of the variables that are available to us. So um, inside the compute message, so we will have this digital CD data frame available to us. So what do we want to do here? Right, so let's try to create a, you know, Recall that in this case, our forecast score is basically the same as it's basically the same as uh, this raw value of this alpha. You're not looking at the relative ranking, right? Even if it's slightly positive or slightly negative, it means that we're going to take first more negative positions. We're not taking baskets and then going to for a basket. Uh, the true value of the alpha is not going to be post-process. There's not, there's not going to be any more processing, right? This is the value of the alpha when we're going to be trading this relative to other assets. So which means that um, we don't have to do uh, this kind of ranking anymore. But we're still going to you know, okay, create an alpha data frame. So let's do the alpha df. We're going to p.concat. And this is one. Okay, we have alpha df. We can do this. Um, so this would be same. And then alpha df is to for the fill, 
I think that's what we want in our logic. And remember that we're no longer returning a dictionary. We want to return a NumPy array. So uh, what's going to happen here is we're going to take um, alpha to the lock. Okay, so we're going to take um, this alpha to the lock. Change the values. Change the values. Now, let's try to run this and see whether things work as you wanted to. Okay, now, now for good measure, let's try to plot the, um, plot the PML curve and we'll show it to you um, how this works. So let's try to run the second alpha plot. You realize that we have, okay. Mm. Okay, so we just want to take this away. Now we realize that something very weird is happening. What's happening is um, basically the logic changed, right? Inside the previous one. We got 26,599 as the end encapsulation. But in our case, what happened is we got no trace all the way until the very end of the data. So we're going to show you what's happening here. Um, that's, I mean, it's always easiest to see here, right? So in positions, um, most of the time, this is where the crux of the um, problems happen. So this is where the uh, all of the computation kind of culminates to. So you want to verify, anytime you run into an error, you kind of want to verify that this is correct, because well, we already know that PNL computation and everything is gotten out of the way. Now, quite interestingly, okay, we have positions, it's just completely NAND. And what, what else is NAND? So this is strategy scaler, this is forecast, and then forecast shifts. Now, we will realize that something very weird happened, right? Because we're dividing by NAND, Okay, what's happening here? Um, all our forecasts are NAND. No, okay, let's go back to the original code in alpha 1 and see what happens. Right here, we always have 1s and zeros. And every day, we will have 25% of the basket long, 25% of the basket short. Therefore, when we forecast, we never run into a problem of having NAND forecasts. But in our case, we have NAND forecasts. So what that means is, inside this alpha 2 to pi bar, this is an area of NANDs. When you sum an absolute value of an area of NANDs, you get NAND value, which is this and then when you divide in any array, so it doesn't matter anything here, it doesn't matter. Okay, when we divide any array by NAND, you basically get an array of NANDs. So therefore your positions are all NAND. Now, which means that you can do the error handling over here, right? So for example, here you can say um, if it's all NAND, you know, submit zero, put zero, otherwise um, return the sum of the absolute value of the forecast. And you can keep doing that every single time. You know, you can check your forecast, um, see if it's you know has any invalid values and stuff like that. And the problem here is, um, now, we did that. In fact, we did that over here, right? We did the masking, and then we replaced um, all the infinity and negative infinity values with NAND values. And then, and that's why inside the forecast data frame, we did not have to have work with any NAND values. And we were comfortable with this not being um, an invalid or NAND value. So, that's interesting. I hope that um, so far the discussions should lead you to be aware that as much as possible, we don't want to do this inside the alpha 2 class because if you keep doing it inside this function, you want to code a new strategy, you're going to have to you know, check the edge cases and you know, check whether your code is valid and you're going to keep repeating um, the work after and over and over again. And after some time, you know, you're bound to make mistakes. You are definitely bound to make mistakes, right? So if you code up a new strategy, then you know, you're going to run the code and then you're going to get um, the result like you just got. And then you have to debuff the error and then realize, okay, the forecast is NAND value. You're going to have to print out every single statement and um, do the heavy work. Now, instead, if you do the checking inside this utility class, then you don't have to do, then even if you make mistakes inside these minor mistakes like um, error validation inside the alpha 2 class or the strategy implementation, the engine will take care of itself, right? It will be self-correcting the errors. 
which means what do you want to do here? Right. Let's take okay, four costs. So we're going to take four costs equals to um, positions equals to. We're going to apply something like this over here, and then get this, and then uh, here you want to um, move this, right? So this will set all the net form costs to zero, and the order infinity and negative infinity form costs to zero, okay? and then here. Maybe you look at the code. We we'll probably still need this, right? We really need this. Okay, if you go to the second alpha class, we're also doing anything else subdash and forecast, and we're also doing this. And in fact, you know, we don't really want to keep doing this. So let's get rid of this. Okay. So forecast will return only a single value. This will return to alpha three, which means here we only take one value. And then uh, let's try something like forecast chips equals to np dot sum. Np dot apps and forecast. Np dot zeros. So let's try this and see what happens. So maximum is called dimension four and minus thirteen. What's happening here? Oh, okay. Um, this one I'm going to set to the length of the universe, not the universe. So it's okay. Here we have this, and let's see what happens. Okay. Now, what is the problem, right? So, okay, things have improved and we got results, but unfortunately, um, we've got 26599, and here we have 26645. Now, the problem is. I'll tell you what the problem is. Okay, so the problem is try to think of what we did inside the code that was not factorized. Now we had some code that did something like if, okay, for instance, eligibles you know, do something, um, for instance, non eligibles uh, do um, set to zero, right? Now, we want to question whether what we are doing here in the factorized code is replicating the exact same thing as the sequential non-factorized code, as the iterative code. Now, let's try to, you know, paint a scenario where uh, we're doing this wrongly. For example, we have forecast array that is um, something along the lines of, you know, 0, 1, 3, 5, Two. And what happens if this one actually belongs and the eligibility mask is something along the lines of you know one zero one one? But what happens is this forecast because the eligibles um, because we do this and this ineligible alpha signal is not nan nor positive infinity or negative infinity, right? We're not going to do anything about this value, which means inside this forecast chips calculation. Right, in, in calculating how much to distribute of capital, we're going to use we're going to sum up this value, which basically affects the rest of the computation downstream. Now, instead, what we want our forecast to do, right, is something along the lines of you know zero, you know, ignore, then three, five, and two, and then you know go on from there. How do we ignore this? Now, as I said, we could do this inside of this. We could do something like forecast divided by eligibles, or um, or you know set that to you know, none and do the masking over there. But if you keep doing it inside of this function, sooner or later you're going to forget or make an error. Yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to um, basically make the changes over here, right? So forecast, and uh, we, we have eligible row, which basically um, if the eligible mask is boolean is equal to one, we're going to get the original forecast. Otherwise, we're going to divide by zero, which is going to send it to one of these invalid values. And then we're going to get the forecast chips. So let's see whether this implementation is now accurate, right? So let's go back and um, let's see what happens. So let's close this here. Mm. 
Now we see that our capital is the same as the previous one, and our implementation logic is accurate. Now, I mean, that is it's okay. That's good. So now we're running the same logic that took about 400 seconds at a very attractive 12 seconds. So that's our alpha 2 class. Right. Mm. Okay. Moving on. We want to do the same for the alpha 3 class. Right. So let's just set over here. Let's do alpha 2 class for inspiration. And let's try to change the code over here. We don't have to change too much code, right? It's all very similar. So the alpha three class, let's just you know, as before, let's create let's say, a temporary list, store the results, and then let's put this inside here. And then Try to create this. I think we can just do this directly. There's nothing particularly unique that will require us to change. And then here, instead of returning a dictionary, we just return um, this. Oh uh, no. We want to return. Try to run it again. Okay, that's our alpha three class. So let's go to main pipe and then let's run alpha three. Let's do that again. Okay, so this should return us the same capital as this one. So awesome, everything works as expected. But here I want to raise an interesting question. What would you expect to be a possible improvement you can to make the code run faster, right? If you look here, you get four costs. And what can we do to make the code run faster? Recall that when we were optimizing this particular set of lines, the operations between time and series and operations between the numpy arrays had implicit type costing operations behind the scene in order to make the operations compatible. In this case, we're returning a pandas series. So it would be faster if you if you did this, right? So if you did this, let's see how long that would take. I think it would take maybe two or three seconds faster. So previously it took 14 seconds. See now it takes only 12 seconds. So we improve the runtime by two seconds. Now, what about one more improvement? Let's think about what we discussed over and over again. We keep emphasizing that we want our code to be robust and efficient in the general case. We just what we just did was to do this over here, right? Now, when we are implementing a alpha module or a generic class, we cannot expect the person or the engine you're implementing using our module to you know, correctly return a numpy array most all of the time. So, you know, for example, um, we can do something like um, so. So, which means that sometimes you return a pandas data series, and sometimes you return a numpy array. So, we want to do something like four plus equal to four plus short pandas. Now, this will throw an error. Now, in the event that he does return a pandas, um, in, the, in the event that he does in fact return us a numpy array. Then we're gonna do. Then we're gonna get a numpy array here, and this is gonna throw an error. Of course, um, we can do something like you know, assert that the type of forecast is the same as the type of you know, or it's a numpy array. But a better practice would be to you know say that if type of forecast equals to numpy series, then forecast equals to numpy band. In this case, it doesn't matter whether the person returns a panda series or numpy array which means that in the future, when we are reusing our alpha module to create new strategies, 
there's a lot more flexibility and a lot more leeway for us to you know, just focus on the logic implementation for the alphas and signal generation rather than you know, what is the internal implementation of the code and so on and so forth. So I think this means that all of the code is now complete. So we have um, all three of our alphas running fine. Okay, let's just do one last one to make sure. Right. Run our code and verify that our refactorization is correct. Oh. Hmm. What happened here? No weak measures just by symmetry. Oh, it was wrong. Okay. No. We're not allowed to do an impulse debug division. Okay, it just can't do the operation in place. And there is a difference um, between the previous operation and just now. Right? If you do something like this, um, okay, the first one, this operation, right, uh, this forecast. If you do this, this operation is different from this. What happens here is this has the same memory address as this. So these two are the same objects. On the other hand, when we do this, this is created in a new place in memory. So we take object 1, divided by object 2, and assign it to object 3 in a different memory, and this object disappears. On the other hand, this one is in place, so we go to the place, we go to where it is in physical memory on the computer, and then we do the division. But you know, we don't need it to be in place, so we can just do this and let's try this. Let's run the code again. Okay, so all of our simulations took about 12 seconds to complete. And the logic is the same as the original and inefficient code. I think with that, um, inside the next lecture, I just want to do slightly more optimizations, right, just to make everything more perfect. And then we're going to just complete these um, level one classes. So thank you for watching.